I've been using both the iPhone 14 Pro Max and the S23 Ultra for many months now. And in the past, I always ended up using the iPhone more often for its faster speed and longer battery life. But this year, the S23 Ultra received a big SoC and camera upgrade. So can it finally beat the iPhone now? Let's compare every aspect of these two phones. And in the end, we'll see which one is the best flagship phone. Okay, so I think in the last five years, there has not been an Android SoC that's faster than a contemporary Apple SoC in terms of the CPU and GPU. But H N2 and the S23 Ultra actually changes that. It has 10% more GPU performance than the A16 in the iPhone 14 Pro Max. And in terms of the CPU, it's only about 10% behind in terms of the multi-core. This is definitely a pretty massive upgrade over the last gen S22 Ultra. But also, as you can see here, the S23 Ultra has quite a bit better heat dissipation than the iPhone 14 Pro Max. I think this is a pretty big win for the Samsung in terms of mobile gaming, but this reflects in my daily use too. I did find that the S23 Ultra seemed to have less random hiccups than its predecessor when I was trying to do a few things at once. So like having a video playing in the picture in picture while just scrolling on something else. I think the extra CPU speed probably helped in that. And as for the iPhone, so it has always been extremely smooth. In my daily use, I almost never experienced an unexpected hiccup. But overall this time in terms of the performance, I would say Samsung barely edges out a win with its better cooling and faster GPU. But even if you're not a gamer, the SoC still matters a lot since a more efficient one will also help your phone last quite a bit longer. And the new Agent 2 is much improved in this regard as well. So I had the phones do 4K video playback for 9.5 hours. They all started at 100% and in the end, the S23 Ultra dropped 8% less than the S22 Ultra. Considering that they both have the same 5,000 milliamp hour battery size, this is pretty impressive. However, what's even more impressive is that the iPhone still beats the Samsung's, even with its smaller battery. It dropped 5% less than the S23 Ultra. And when it comes to heavy gaming, so in a one hour long test running a benchmark loop, the iPhone actually did even better, dropping 10% less than the S23 Ultra. Overall, the battery life between these two is pretty close now, with the Samsung just slightly behind. But at least the Samsung can charge much faster at 45 watts, while the iPhone can only charge at 20 watts. So a 30 minute charge at max speed from zero will give you 70% on the S23 Ultra, but only 42% on the iPhone 14 Pro Max. It's definitely nice to be able to charge fast, especially if I'm in a hurry to go somewhere. However, do note that the Samsung needs a charger that specifically supports Samsung Fast Charge in order to get the full speed. So in terms of battery life this year, it's still a win for the iPhone, which is pretty impressive for the phone with the smaller battery. All right, and when it comes to the display, so considering that Samsung makes the screen for the iPhone 14 Pro Max, you would think that the Samsung flagship would have the best screen ever, but this is actually one aspect where the S23 Ultra kind of let me down. One issue that I almost never see mentioned is off angle color shift. And the S23 Ultra has a pretty noticeable color shift when viewing it from an angle. Now, of course, most of the time you don't look at the screen from the side, but it still makes the overall experience feel somewhat less refined. And especially when you want to show someone else something, more viewing angle would be nice. Another minor annoyance is HDR playback. The iPhone can play HDR in picture in picture in the YouTube mini player, whereas HDR only kicks in on the Samsung when you go full screen. And when you do so, there's also a pretty noticeable brightness jump and all the UI elements will become pretty bright. But when you swipe away, the brightness will jump again. So it just feels somewhat jarring to watch HDR content on the Samsung, but it technically doesn't affect the HDR performance once you start watching it. So this is kind of just a small nitpick. And this brightness jump happens when you play HDR videos in the Samsung's photo gallery as well. But where I think the iPhone really pulls ahead is that it can use the display's full HDR potential to display photos that you take. In the iPhone's photo app, the highlights in a photo just tend to look way more eye-catching. And so I feel like if you took a photo on the iPhone and the same photo on the Samsung and you show both photos on the phone to someone else, then the photo on the iPhone will almost always look more impressive than the photo of the same thing on the Samsung. And this is even if the photos are actually similar in quality when you import them into a computer or post them online. But I do want to point out that if you do have an Apple Silicon Mac, then this HDR effect in the photo will show up in the Max photo app as well. But yeah, I personally really like this effect. I feel like it just makes the pictures look more real. And also the iPhone's display can go brighter at 2000 nits peak as opposed to 1750 nits peak on the S23 Ultra. This isn't a huge difference in real life though. Overall, I would say that both are great screens with high resolution and high refresh rate. Technically the Samsung does have a higher resolution, but it's pretty difficult
difficult to tell the difference. All right, and something else that's different is that the S23 Ultra still has a slightly curved screen. This slightly darkens the content near the edge, and it's especially noticeable on lighter backgrounds, which I personally don't really like. But at the same time, the curved screen does make the sides feel really smooth, which you might like. And as for the colors, so the Samsung defaults to the vivid mode, which definitely exaggerates the colors. It's inaccurate, but if you don't really care, then you might like it because it does have a bit more pop. And on the natural mode, the colors are definitely a lot more toned back, and it does seem to be a bit more bland than on the iPhone. All in all, the Samsung's display isn't bad at all, and it might even be the second best phone display in existence right now. But it's just that the iPhone screen has quite a few small wins, both in the hardware and the software that supports it. And when it comes to their designs, so both phones are quite large with a 6.7, 6.8 inch screen. Their back materials do feel quite similar. Both are matte glass. They feel great in the hand and they're pretty good at resisting fingerprints. I find that the S23 Ultra feels more comfortable to hold vertically with its rounded sides, but the iPhone is definitely more comfortable to hold horizontally with its rounded bottoms. And both of these phones are definitely pretty heavy, but the iPhone is six grams heavier, probably due to its stainless steel rim, whereas the Ultra has an aluminum one. And technically the stainless steel is more durable than aluminum, but I personally don't really think it's all that meaningful because both phones are mostly covered by glass and that's just way more fragile. Now the iPhone does have LiDAR and the Ultra doesn't have any depth camera. And I think LiDAR isn't talked about enough because it can definitely be pretty useful. For example, the iPhone's measuring tool is just so much more accurate than the Samsung's. Recently, I was looking at some new furniture and this measuring tool was definitely very helpful. LiDAR is also great if you want to place things in your room virtually with something like the IKEA app. But the S23 Ultra definitely has its own pretty unique features, and one of them is the S Pen. I really like this thing. It's super comfortable to write with. It's great for writing down quick reminder notes, and there's actually a feature called Screen Off Memo that allows you to basically start writing as soon as you pull out the S Pen without even turning on the screen. I've also found it pretty helpful to be able to add handwritten annotations to my screenshots. And there's actually plenty of non-writing uses for the S Pen too, such as translating, and it can even be a remote shutter button. All right, but one of my favorite features of the iPhone is MagSafe. MagSafe accessories are just so clean. I love using a MagSafe phone stand. A MagSafe battery bank can just attach itself to the back of the phone and it doesn't need any cables. I've also seen some super clean looking MagSafe car mounts. However, the MagSafe feature isn't all that unique to the iPhone because you can kind of add the feature to the Samsung with a magnetic ring or a case. And I definitely think it's pretty worth it. But Samsung does have reverse charging and it's something come in handy quite a few times for me. When I'm out and my earbuds die, I can just pop them onto the back of the phone and it will reverse charge. And another design aspect that's just much better on the Samsung is the USB-C port because it's over 10 times faster than the lightning port for file transfer. So if you move lots of photos, videos, or other files from your phone to a computer, then the Samsung is going to be much better for that. This is also quite unfortunate for the iPhone because it does support ProRes and ProRAW. Both file types are massive and they're probably the ones that that you'd want to edit on a computer, the iPhone can definitely benefit from faster file transfer. But maybe the next iPhone just might have USB-C. And as for their speakers, I think they're pretty comparable. Both of them sound pretty good. All right, so overall, both of these phones are very well built. LiDAR and MagSafe on the iPhone is very useful, but with a magnetic ring on the Samsung, you can easily get most of the benefits of MagSafe in terms of the easy alignment with wireless chargers and also the accessories. However, you can't really attach a pen to the iPhone Phone, and the S Pen definitely brings some pretty useful and fun features to the S23 Ultra. So I would say Samsung wins for the design. And next, let's compare their software, which is definitely very important for the overall user experience. In iOS 16, there are live activities, and on the iPhone 14 Pro Max, they show up in the dynamic island, as well as on the lock screen and in the notification center. I think they're pretty cool and helpful, but I actually find the live activities showing up on the lock screen to be more useful than them being in the dynamic island. Island because one, the widget on the lock screen is just much bigger and it shows much more information than in a dynamic island. And also just most of the time I have my phone locked. So I see the live activity on the lock screen more often. And at seven months since the iPhone came out, there are now a pretty good number of apps that have a live activity function. One of them is Uber. The time tracker app that I use called Toggle Track also has it and it's pretty nice. Now moving on to their home screens. So Samsung definitely just has a lot more features for home screen customization 
customization. For starters, it allows for different grid sizes. You can place the app anywhere, whereas the iPhone doesn't have those. And also with just one click, you can set a color theme based on your wallpaper or apply a theme from the Galaxy Store. I personally really love themes. I just feel like it brings the overall look of the phone together so nicely. Now you can theme an iPhone as well, but there's no way to do it automatically. You have to change each app icon by hand, so it just takes much longer. The S23 Ultra also has this extra edge panel where you can put some extra apps and some other things as well. To be honest, I don't really find this all that useful. I rarely use it, but it doesn't hurt to have. Now, good luck on the Samsung is quite useful. One cool thing that you can do with it is to give the keyboard a backlight so that it kind of looks like a mechanical keyboard. Another pretty useful thing is that you can change the step size for the volume slider. And of course, widgets on Android can be interactive, so I can skip tracks, play pause directly from the widget, whereas widgets on the iPhone can only display things. So yeah, Samsung just lets you do so much more than the iPhone in terms of the home screen. And before we continue, a quick message from today's video sponsor, Epidemic Sound. They have a huge library of professionally produced music and sound effects, and they add new tracks every week. I like using music and sound effects to make my videos more engaging, and when I use Epidemic Sound, I never have to worry about takedowns or copyright strikes. You can search tracks by their genre, mood, or theme. There are also playlists curated by many other content creators. When picking my music, I like to browse by the genre and also look at the mood in order to convey various feelings throughout my video. Epidemic Sound has licenses that are ideal for content creators and businesses. You can click the link down below to get a free 30-day trial plus 25% off the annual subscription with my code CVLA25. And everything that you post during your trial is protected even if you cancel. But for their lock screens, so with the One UI 5 update, the Samsung lock screen has kind of become more similar to the iPhones. Now for both of them, you press and hold to edit and then you can change the clock font and colors. Samsung does also let you change the two shortcuts to be any other app while the iPhone doesn't, but the iPhone does let you create multiple lock screens, which I like to do. However, the biggest reason why I prefer the iPhone's lock screen over the Samsung's is the lock screen widgets. I think they look really nice. The ones that I use the most are battery and weather widgets. I find them super useful because the battery widget just lets me easily see the battery of my other connected accessories, and then the weather just tells me the temperature, the condition of the outside at a glance. Both of these are just first-party widgets, but you can add third-party ones, so the possibilities are pretty endless. Now, the Samsung does have lock screen widgets as well, but they're pretty different in that third-party apps cannot develop for it, so your options are just far fewer compared to on the iPhone. Also, they're not actually directly shown on the lock screen. You have to tap on the clock in order to see them, and I also don't think they're laid out very aesthetically. All right, but something else about the iPhone's lock screen widgets is that they show up on the always-on display as well. When the iPhone is just sitting on my desk. It looks quite pretty with its dim wallpaper. The clock and also all the widgets stand out and it's really easy to read them. Other things that show up on the iPhone's always on display are the notifications and also the live activities. Those no longer update by the second, but it still updates itself intermittently. I really like that just at a glance without even having to touch the phone screen, I can know what's going on with like my weather and also notifications and any live activities that I have going on. But always on display on the Samsung is definitely not bad. You can add an image or a moving image there, which looks really cute. And with third-party apps, you can get more always on display designs, but you can also get a music control directly displayed as well as your notifications. Overall though, the iPhone's AOD is my favorite. And previously I tested it and found that it's actually also more battery efficient. And moving on to their photo galleries, which has quite a few features on both of them. After a software update on the Samsung, you can now also do the photo cutout thing just like on the iPhone. I actually think this is super fun. I like to just send random transparent cutouts to other people. Also on both, you can select text from videos and photos, which is pretty useful. Samsung does have a few extra editing tools. One of them is the object eraser, which I find very intuitive to use. I think it's nice to be able to easily and quickly remove like strangers from my photos. But the iPhone also has a pretty cool feature in that you can animate a live photo by turning it into a loop and the long exposure looks really cool too. And one more thing that's worth mentioning is multitasking on the Samsung. So it can do split screen and pop-up view. I think they're somewhat useful, especially on a big phone like this. 
All right, so overall for the software, I like the One UI home screen more just because it has so many more features, but I think the iPhone's lock screen is better. One UI does have quite a few extra features and some are definitely pretty helpful, but I take advantage of the live activities in iOS 16 more often than pretty much all of the extra features in One UI. It's a draw for the software. It really depends on which features you like more. And lastly, the cameras. So the Samsung's main lens is 200 megapixels while the iPhone's is 48. But on the iPhone, in order to actually get a 48 megapixel image, you need to take it in raw while on the Samsung, you can just toggle on the 200 megapixel mode. I think the compressed high res photo on the Samsung is easily justifiable for its extra quality. And the file size is not too large. The raw photos on the iPhone are typically much larger. So I definitely wish the iPhone had a 48 megapixel non-raw option. And when it comes to those images, so the Samsung's 200 megapixel photo is a bit better than the iPhone's 48. It just has more detail and it's especially noticeable when we punch in. But both of the main lens are very capable with a big sensor and a fast lens. They have pretty comparable depth of field and both do pretty well in low light as well. I love the high res mode on both phones because it not only provides more detail, but also reduces the sharpening artifacts compared to the regular 12 megapixel mode. However, I know that the default 12 megapixel mode will probably be used much more often. And in daytime, I would say the photos are pretty close with the Samsung having more saturated colors. And for lower light and at night, I also prefer the Samsung's photos because the darker regions just tend to be better preserved. However, when it comes to the three times telephoto lens, the photos from the iPhone are still noticeably more sharp than the Samsung's. But of course, the S23 Ultra has a 10 times telephoto lens, which is just a ridiculous amount of reach and it can definitely get you some really cool shots. In this department, there's pretty much no other phone that can match it. For the iPhone, when you digitally crop in 10 times, the quality is just completely gone. And as for their ultra wides, so I would say both are pretty good and they actually both have autofocus so you can do macro mode. Now as for the video, so the S23 Ultra can do 8K, which honestly surprised me with how good it looks. It has much less obvious sharpening compared to the 4K video from both itself and the iPhone. But a small downside is that you can't shoot 8K in HDR yet. The iPhone 14 Pro Max can only go up to 4K. And when it comes to the 4K HDR video, I would say the iPhone seems to expose a bit more consistently and just look a bit better in general. I also think that the stabilization on the iPhone is slightly better. Overall, the camera is a draw since both have their advantages. The S23 Ultra has a much longer reach and it can also do up to 8K for its video. However, the iPhone does have a better three times telephoto lens and it's also better at doing HDR video. But unlike last year, the S23 Ultra's main lens can easily keep up with the iPhones now and it might even be better in some situations. All right, so the S23 Ultra won in terms of the performance and the design. However, the iPhone took the crown for the battery life and the display and it was a draw for the software and the cameras. So overall, it results in a draw. We can't declare a winner, but I think this is reflective of the improvements that Samsung has made compared to last gen. It no longer feels like a slower phone and the battery life keeps up as well. The camera hardware is also very competitive with the iPhone. I think software is where they differ the most. I would say Samsung has a higher quantity of features and lots of them are very interesting and fun, even though the iPhone doesn't have as many, but the ones that they do have are very polished and useful. So depending on your priorities and what features you actually use, either phone can be the winner for you. All right, so that's it. All of the links will be down below. You can follow me on Instagram and you can also watch more here.